loud. All right, um, hopefully that's okay with everybody. This way, by recording, we're trying to create a good repository and a good bank of continuing education so that you all can use it in the future as well, um, be able to, to pull it up for trainings, be able to use it if you know, you're trying to do a directed education plan or have a particular topic you need to hit. So recording is for that purpose and that purpose only, um, really just for education and, and training going forward. So thank you guys for tuning in. I'm Angela Wright. I'm an emergency physician at the University of Colorado Anschutz Hospital, um, an EMS physician. I do medical direction for um, a couple agencies for Ray, Colorado, which I see some of my folks on from Ray. Ah, oh, there's Steve uh, just tuning in. And he's got his camera on. Hey, Steve. <laughs> he's trying to figure out how to turn his camera off and he's on mute. So this is great for me. Uh, for Ray, Colorado, as well as for uh, uh, Byers and Strasburg and, and some other more um, rural areas throughout Colorado. So really excited to be here with you all. This is part of our Reese program, which is our rural EMS education series. The hope being to take topics that you may hear in different venues as far as education and training, but put in a few bits um, and really try to direct it towards things and particular challenges that you guys are seeing in the field. And especially in the field when you're 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 minutes from a hospital. I think a lot of our training in EMS is really dedicated towards the folks that have a six minute transport to a level one trauma center, stroke center, STEMI center. And we recognize and appreciate that uh, it's not like that everywhere. So we wanna make sure that we're providing resources and education um, to all of our folks that are, that are serving our communities. Um, also, I wanna take a quick moment to say happy EMS week to each and every one of you. I imagine by tuning in that you are, in fact, an EMS person in one way or another. So thank you all for being here, but happy EMS week. Thank you all very much for everything you do every day to take care of your communities, to take care of each other. Um, what you do is extraordinarily important um, and absolutely incredible, the work that, that you all um, do each and every day. So thank you guys. Happy EMS week. And with that, we will dive in. Um, so tonight's talk, we're talking uh, a little bit about spine and back and some all things related to that. I've entitled it My Back Hurts because A, it does in fact hurt and B, um, everybody's back hurts at some point and then we'll talk a little bit more about why tonight. So we're going to go through basic anatomy and physiology of the spinal column. For those of you who have turned in uh, or tuned in, excuse me, to a lecture of mine in the past, you may know I, I structure them pretty similarly. We do an anatomy review, um, have some topics, and then also to have some cases peppered in there to kind of help highlight different things and different pathologies that we want to cover. So we'll review basic anatomy and physiology. We'll recognize some of the major mechanisms for cervical spine injuries. We'll identify some of the different types of cervical spine injuries that exist. We'll talk a little bit about C collars and C spine immobilization, spinal motion restriction. We'll discuss the differences between spinal shock and neurogenic shock. And we'll recognize there's a typo, the common causes of atraumatic back pain and appreciate some of our treatment modalities that we may have for these types of patients. Okay. So diving in, spinal anatomy. So as we all know, the spine is part of the skeletal system, right? Specifically, the bones of the spinal column are part of the sp skeletal system. And they're important because they provide framework and they bear a lot of the weight of the body. This is why it hurts over time, right? They're bearing a ton of the weight and a ton of the structural components of the human body. And specifically, when we talk about the bones of the spinal um, column, we're talking about the vertebral column, which is part of the axial skeleton. So as you know, this is divided up into the cervical spine, which has seven vertebrae, the thoracic spine, which has 12. Remember, I always remembered this when I was learning it from medical school, you have 12 ribs, you have 12 thoracic vertebrae, your lumbar spine, which has five lumbar vertebrae, and then your pelvic area of your spine, which includes your sacrum and your coccyx. Also important to remember that some people have variations in this anatomy. You can have what's called sacralization of L5 or other differences where you have different numbers of vertebrae in different areas of your spine. Um, those are obviously the exception and not the rule. 
Vertebrae are unique in their appearance given the where they are in the spinal column, okay? But they share some basic structures. They're slightly different, again, if you're in the cervical spine, from the thoracic spine, from the lumbar spine, but overall they have the same components. So they have a body, which you can see the different pieces there in that in um, that diagram up top. So the major, the biggest chunk of, oh, this is what I was going to try to do. I was going to try to annotate. I can use a spotlight or an arrow. Um, so the biggest biggest chunk of the vertebrae, which is this the body or this area here. Um, I don't really love that. I'm just going to go back to my mouse. Sorry, guys. I'm trying to get clever. And then there's the pedicles, the transverse processes, and the spinous processes, and the lamina. So you can see on the different diagrams here, um, the lamina being here and here, the spinous process being here. So this is anterior, the front part of the vertebrae. This is posterior. So when you're feeling down someone's back, what you're feeling are the spinous processes. And again, they look a little bit different in the different parts of the spine, but they all have the same components. And then the foramen is where is the word that we use for the anatomy where the nerve root passes through. So the nerves come out of the foramina or in the foramen. And then the uh, spinal cord, of course, is in the canal, which is in this hole in the middle of the bony vertebrae. So here's an x-ray to kind of help put this into context of what it looks like in the human body. So in this x-ray here on the left in diagram A, um, it, we're looking directly at a person and we're x-raying directly through them and through their spine. So here's their pelvic bone. You guys can see my cursor, right? As I'm outlining some of these things. Yeah, yeah. I could see it earlier. Yeah. Thanks so much. Okay. So here's the pelvic bone. And then here are your vertebrae uh, running up and down the spinal column here. These are your ribs coming off the vertebrae. So this is just showing us on x-ray form your body. So remember that really, really thick part, the pedicles or that side parts, and then your superior and inferior facets, um, where your facets are, are part of the joint aspect of your spinal column. You have your transverse processes, the things that go laterally, and then the lamina your spinous process, which you can see through here. Um, and that's again, what you're feeling when you're feeling down somebody's back. Now, if you look at the lateral view here, so we're looking at somebody standing at us from the side. So here's their ribs. Here's a bunch of their gas, their bowel gas, but here you have the body and you can really see the disc spaces. So we'll go over in just a second what lives in there. But these are the um, vertebral bodies here, those nice little squares. So more pictures of x-rays. You can see x-rays are actually really not great um, imaging modalities for looking at details within the spine, believe it or not. Um, the spine, especially the bodies, are so thick that fractures, subtle fractures, are really, really hard to see on x-ray. But here's a couple more views of, of the different um, components of the spinal column. So again, this nice vertebral body here, um, the intervertebral disc being the space, and this is a very healthy looking spine, as is this one, because you can see all of these nice spaces that are going through there. So what about the other components of the spine? So remember the spinal column and the vertebrae are the bones, right? And they're kept in their place and they function for movement because they're head to, held together by muscles and ligaments just like our knee joints and our elbow joints and our wrist joints and our shoulder joints all have muscles and ligaments, we have to have that in our spinal joints as well. So there's also this cartilaginous cushion, right? A bunch of cartilage between each of the vertebrae. And if we go back, we're talking about in between here, there's a bunch of cartilage between each of those vertebral bodies. And that's called the disc, right? So that's the, the intervertebral disc. When people say I have a slipped disc, and we'll talk a little more about that in a bit, but that's what they're referring to. They're referring to that chunk of cartilage between the vertebral bodies. Um, fun fact, there's no disc between the occiput, the base of the skull, and C1, nor is there a disc between C1 and C2. Um, so the discs start between C2 and C3. And by having these discs, the spine is creating room for the nerves to exit the spinal cord and then carry the signals throughout the body, right? Because it's ultimately what we need our spinal cord to do is carry all of those messages coming from our brain and going to our brain 
all throughout the rest of the, the different parts of our body. And they can't do that if the bones are just squished on top of each other, because then there's nowhere for the nerves to come out, nowhere for those, those um, nice big nerve sheaths to exit from that kind of complicated puzzle. That's the vertebral column. So the disc creates room for those nerves to exit the spinal cord and carry their signals. And then don't forget, there's also spinal fluid. So there's the cerebral spinal fluid that exists that's um, kind of coursing around the spinal column and other components of the uh, of the spinal cord and also the brain. Okay, so we, like we talked about, so we've got a lot of joints. So we have the bones, we have the muscles, and we have the ligaments. So we have all of those components that help us have our joints. And that's what allows us to move our spine in different planes. And the different components of the spine have different capabilities and axes of movement, right? So your cervical spine has different axes of movement than your thoracic spine, than your lumbar spine. And that comes into play, especially when we're talking about injuries and, and other things like that. So for your cervical spine, um, and I actually was going to turn my camera on for this, you have flexion and extension, right? And then you have lateral flexion, which is kind of a weird one to do, um, and then rotation, right? So you've got, you can do the lateral movements, you can do flexion and extension, and you can do rotation. I had a video of an owl on here turning its head all the way around, but it kind of creeped me out. And then for your thoracic spine, of course, flexion, extension, and lateral flexion, very little rotation, but a little bit of rotation that happens on the thoracic spine. And then the lumbar spine is flexion, extension, and some lateral flexion. So all important movements that we have because ultimately the spinal column is made of a series of joints. So the goal of this is not to teach y'all how to read CT scans of the cervical spine, but it really helps, I think, kind of solidify the anatomy we were just talking about. So here we're looking at a sagittal cut again through the cervical spine. You can see the base. Um, let me try this spotlight. Let's try this. You can see the base of the skull right here. Oop, no, okay. You can see the base of the skull right here. And over here, this is your airway, right? So this is your, the back part of your mouth going into your trachea. Here's your little epiglottis hanging out there, right? Um, and so this is the front part of the body. And then here we have uh, what's called the odontoid, which is part of C2. So C1 is all this little thing here and this little thing here, and it's attaching, but we just don't see that in this cut. And this is part of C2, which is the odontoid process here. So these are, again, those vertebral bodies. But one of the things that this slide shows us nicely with it being a CT scan is some of the different lines that we look at when we're looking for injury. So this red line in the most anterior aspect, that's our anterior vertebral line. Then we look at our posterior vertebral line and then our spinal laminar line here and our interspinous line here. And what we're looking for are smooth lines and the expected curvature of these things. So when I look at a CT of the cervical spine, if there's an injury, these lines are often disrupted. So if this vertebral body is way up here, that means that this line is not going to be straight. If this vertebral body is way back here, that means, again, it's not going to be straight. So those are some of the ways that we look to um, read for injuries when we're looking at cervical spine x-rays and actually uh, RCT scans, um, and similar for the rest of the spine as well as really defining these different lines. And so here we see a little bit more of the spaces. So in the green of those disc spaces, the intervertebral discs and the interspinous space, um, CTs are not great at showing us details of the discs and the ligaments. They show us how everything lines up, but they don't do a great job. They do a great job with the bones. They don't do a great job with the soft tissues. They don't do a great job with the nerve. So um, that's why oftentimes for spinal issues, you will need to, to ultimately get an MRI. Um, and if anyone's ever seen a doctor for back pain, you know that ultimately they're going to send you for an MRI. All right. So let's dive into a case um, because these are more fun and it's a good way to learn. All right. So we have an MVC. This is our case one. So you're dispatched to a multiple vehicle MVC. And you're the third unit in. So you're lucky to be um, in a place that has three ambulances available, but let's just say it's a mutual aid situation. So um, multiple vehicles were involved. 
So they did an all call and they were able to get other ambulances to respond. And you're on the third unit, you get to extricate and take care of the patient that's in the fourth car uh, that was involved in this MVC. So your patient is a 48 year old male who was a restrained driver. The airbags did deploy and he is complaining of, you guessed it, back pain. He smells strongly of alcohol. All right, our patient has chronic back pain, um, but certainly after this car accident, it's gotten significantly worse. It's worse when he tries to move, it's worse with any palpation. He describes it as constant and throbbing. He says that it radiates up and down his back. He rates it at a 10 out of 10, or with many of our patients, they'll say it's a 13 out of 10, or if a 15 out of 10, right? <laughs> and then he says it's been going on for 15 minutes um, since, you know, since the accident started, and then it's just been gradually worsening. Past medical history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia. He takes hydrochlorothiazide, so blood pressure medicine. He takes a statin and he takes a daily aspirin. Again, he's a he's, uh, heavy ETOH use and is also a smoker and has no allergies when you ask him about allergies. So you guys want to get a set of vitals. You find him to have a heart rate of 110. His blood pressure is 100 over 50. His pulse ox is 89% and his end title is 25. So next we're gonna do our rapid trauma assessment, right? And what do we find? ABCs are intact. Okay, good, take a breath there. From an HEENT perspective, he's got some blood in his right nair and some periorbital ecchymosis to his right eye. So a little bit of trauma to that right side of his face. Unsure if that was from hitting the, the airbag or if something flew up from the passenger compartment and hit him in the head, he's not really entirely sure. Tachycardic, which you know, because you got his blood pressure of 110. He has no extremity trauma, uh, clear to auscultation on, on his palm exam as well. And a neuro exam, which is really, really important to do in our patients, right? Especially in our patients that are complaining of back pain or a headache. So we're going to want to look at the, at the organs and at the structures that are in the area that the patients are complaining of symptoms. So for the neuro exam, he's saying that he has decreased sen sensation Again, to that right side, so his right upper extremity and his right lower extremity, but his movement is completely intact. And then when you palp down his spine, everything hurts. So everywhere you touch, that hurts, that hurts, that hurts, that hurts, that hurts. Okay. What's next? So we've done our rapid trauma. We've done a good history. We have a good set of vitals. Um, you did most of this while he was sitting in the car. Um, so what's our next move? Anybody want to throw something out there? C-spine. Good. Okay. C-spine. Put, uh, put a collar on him, maybe. Put a collar on. Get him out of the car. Okay. I like it. You guys can see where we're going with this. Spinal motion restriction, right? This is what we call it now, which is great, but it's been through some iterations over time. Um, and I don't know how long most of you all have been in practice. However, um, even since I got my uh, EMT quite a long time ago, this has gone through some variation and some change. I always think it's interesting to look backwards so that when we go forwards, we try not to repeat what we've already done, right? So in 1967, the American Association for Surgery of Trauma advocated for backwards and extrications of all trauma patients. They said anyone that has suffered any form of trauma needs to be put on a backboard, on a hard board. Okay, we're going to prevent bad spinal injury and we're going to make sure that it's not getting worse by putting every single person on a backboard. And then um, a group of academic physicians led by Bowman did a study from 1950 to 1972. And they looked at 300 patients and the conclusion was that some patients um, that didn't have neck immobilization performed deteriorated clinically. So they said, oh, well, then we should have put everybody in a collar. So now we're all on a collar and we're all on a backboard. Okay. In 1971, orthodicides that they want to weigh in and the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons says, 
uh, spinal immobilization, but just for patients with symptoms and findings of potential spinal cord injury. So they said, you know, this is probably a good idea. We want to make sure we don't have people re-injured. So we're going to do this. We, we agree, but it's only for patients that you're worried about that have hurt their spine. And then there was this concern that we were just missing C-spine fractures left and right, and that we were missing all of these unstable cervical spine injuries. So we decided, again, to just all trauma patients of all mechanisms, we're putting in a collar and we're putting on a backboard. So some more recent studies have failed to demonstrate that we're actually missing missing anything. And not just because we're immobilizing everyone, but they said, well, I wonder if this is not as prevalent as we think. And so we really shifted a lot of our findings to focus more now on mechanism of injury. So are we, are we doing harm? Were we doing harm? Well, there was a growing body of evidence that actually suggested the use of a long backboard can result in harm to patients. They looked at this and found that the increased agitation, it increased pain, it increased the amount that we were radiating patients. So when patients came in on a backboard, they found that they were more likely to get imaging because they felt that there was a higher clinical suspicion for an injury, even though we were putting everybody on one of these things anyway. So we were radiating more people. Um, we work also, especially in the prolonged transport setting and in some of the rural settings and areas when you're on one of these things for more than just six minutes, um, we found that it was increasing pressure sores. It was causing pressure sores, excuse me, increase in causing tissue ischemia, aspiration, and respiratory compromise. So again, you're collared, you're laying on a black backboard. We've all kind of probably been uh, the patient in one of these settings in variations of NREMT training, where everyone has C-spine consideration and then spider straps onto a backboard, right? Well, you can imagine when those patients vomit, airway becomes a big challenge. Um, so we were increasing aspiration, we were causing more damage, and we decided that we really needed to, we really needed to look at this again, and we really needed to fix this. So in the early 2010s, the trends started to really move towards spinal motion restriction. So um, again, remember all of those ways that the spine can move, right? The flexion, extension, rotation, and lateral flexion. And the idea is to minimize the amount that that movement is happening, okay? So spinal motion restriction. We're not immobilizing anymore. We're just limiting some of those movements in order to try to prevent harm, additional harm, but also try to prevent harm from hard spine boards and things like that. And then in 2019, the University of Arizona did a big look back kind of over history since things changed. So looked at that 2010 to 2019 timeframe and found that since trending the spinal motion restriction and being a little more judicious about who we're collaring and, and who we're um, restricting on, on the um, trauma side, that there was no significant in increase in spinal cord injury after the transition. So since we've transitioned to more of the spinal motion restriction, we're really not missing all of these unstable spinal fractures that are causing um, terrible outcomes. So the nexus criteria, so these are criteria that we use most often in the hospital, that, that, but also that we've used to shape spinal motion restriction protocols for, um, for EMS. And this is, again, in the hospital setting, whether or not we're looking at imaging the patients. So these are patients that were like, well, do they need a CT or an x-ray, even though x-rays are garbage? So um, the, the questions here, is there a focal neurologic deficit? Is there midline spinal tenderness? Midline is important here, right? After a car accident, your paraspinal muscles hurt. But is there midline spinal tenderness? Is there altered level of consciousness? Is there intoxication? Or is there a distracting injury? If any of these are yes, then when they get to the hospital, we're probably going to consider imaging them. So if any of these are present in the field, then some element of spinal motion restriction is potentially indicated, right? So these are all of the things that would make us have a higher clinical suspicion that either A, the patient does have an injury, or B, they have a reason to not identify themselves that they may have an injury. Then we have, and sorry, that's a bit blurry, but we have the adult Canadian C-spine rule. So another set of rules um, with some pretty strict inclusion criteria, which is really important when you're looking at decision-making rules is to, they have to meet every single one of those inclusion criteria in order to even go into this. 
And this one's a little more elaborate, right? And, and has a lot of inclusion and exclusion criteria. And then it starts to look at age, a dangerous mechanism, which again is, is very hard to define. They, they did here too, um, but they talk about simple, um, simple rear-ended MVCs or if they're sitting position. Again, I'm not gonna walk you through every step here, but this is another decision tree that we can use to clear someone's C-spine. So if they make it all the way down to the end and then they can move their neck all around, then we can say, we're not gonna image you. And not only that, but I'm gonna become your best friend because I'm gonna take this terrible collar off your neck. But otherwise, if they fall into some of these other categories, they're gonna get a, end up getting imaging. And in the hospital setting, if you guys put a C collar on a patient in the pre-hospital space or have some form of cervical spine motion restriction, we're going to leave that on until we have negative imaging or until we can apply one of these rules. All right. So for patients that have, um, who have, we should consider spinal motion restriction in, including in specifically in blunt trauma. So it used to be that you would put C, -C collars on in anyone that had penetrating neck trauma. We have moved away from that. But if they have a high energy mechanism in any of the following, so altered level of consciousness, um, intoxication, again, inability to communicate, they can't tell you whether or not something hurts, um, spinal pain and tenderness, neurologic complaints, including numbness or motor weakness. It's important in that category. So neurologic complaints, especially when it comes to pain, can be really challenging to suss out. But I've seen a number of spinal column injuries and their, their biggest complaint of pain is, an, is extreme extremity pain. So if they're saying my arms are on fire, my arms hurt, my arms are killing me, but they have no obvious external arm uh, trauma to their arms, then you may want to be considering a spinal injury. Um, if they Obviously, if they have a step off or deformity to the spine, or if they have a, a distracting injury. And the definition, I'm sure of many of you are aware, but the definition of that being injuries that are so severely painful um, that their neck exam is unreliable. So um, if they've got an obvious pneumothorax, if they've got six rib fractures, if their femur is broken, if they have a crush injury, large burns, all those things are going to be focusing the body's um, pain response to that area. And so it's more likely that you're going to miss another type of injury, specifically a spinal injury. All right, and so this is just kind of going through, this is the Denver Metro protocol, and I know some of the protocols um, that you all use are adapted from those, or you may have your own, but again, going over those same things. So do they have any of these, uh, the following of these things? Um, if the answer is no, then you can, uh, and you don't think they have a spinal injury, then you, you can just carry on, right? Um, but if the answer is yes, then you're gonna put a C collar on and you're gonna go through the rest of your protocol and figure out how, um, motion restricted, they need to be. Okay. So if they're walking around on scene and then they have neck pain, um, it's okay to put them in a C collar and transport them in a position of comfort on the gurney, meaning 30 degrees or 45 degrees. Okay. Um, and again, this is our protocol. If you have your own protocols, that's always the caveat with these, right? Make sure you're following your own protocols, but if they can sit there and, and follow instructions, <laughs> which I know is is not always uh, granted, um, but my goodness, especially for, for those of you guys who are, are in these uh, prolonged transport times, right? Um, this is a really, really important to know that it might be okay, um, pending your protocols, to not have them laying flat on their back for the 40 minute ride to the hospital. Okay, so along those lines, we're working today. Remember, we had that MVC. We were the fourth one, and we're doing mutual aid. But we uh, we can't fly. Uh, ceiling's too low. Smoke is too bad. So we have a two-hour transport time. Okay. So our patient, remember, he's this 48-year-old who smells strongly of ETOH, um, has back pain everywhere that you push, um, and we're going to be on the road for two hours. So what do you think you guys want to do? collar and we already established, right? A bunch of you put that in the chat. So we have him in a C collar. How are you going to transport him otherwise? Are you going to lay him flat on your cot? Are you going to have him on a scoop the whole way? Are you going to have him on a long spine board for the entire two hour transport? Position of comfort. What's that, Steve? Position of comfort. 
Position of comfort. Okay. A vacuum mattress. I like it. Becky. Beautiful. Vacuum mattress. Yep. Softer helps with those pressure ulcers. Blanket rolls around his head versus the seat collar. The studies would really tell us that patients that have an unstable C-spine fracture do a pretty good job of self-splinting. So barring a really violent sneeze, for the most part, they do pretty well. So something to consider, right? And I would say specifically if you have a long transport time and your patient can be compliant, um, keeping them a vacuum mattress is a great tool, but making an effort to not have them on a hard board is going to be really important. Um, in the long run. All right, other tidbits, patients over the age of 65 are clinically often unreliable and hide things. Um, so certainly have a higher suspicion for injury in the elderly. Consider it more with high risk mechanisms, okay? Um, communicate to your receiving facility that you're, you have spinal motion restriction um, already done. And then uh, at least for my folks, um, I require neuro exam documentation. So mandatory in all patients with potential spinal trauma. Um, if you have penetrating neck trauma, you don't have to put a C collar on. And if for some reason you can't put a C collar on them, try to find something else that you can. And yeah, Catherine, great question in the chat. So if alcohol, if he smells that strongly of E2H and he rests his car, can he be trusted to maintain safe positioning? Um, it depends, right? Probably not. Some of the intoxicated patients we see will just lie there and follow the instructions. Um, some of them obviously will be uh, agitated, combative, can be violent, right? Can be uh, flopping all over the place. So I think with the ETOH and depending on what else is possibly on board, those are really important considerations. How are you going to make sure that they're limiting the dangerous spinal movements that could potentially worsen their injury? makes it much more complicated. And then do you consider sedation in order to protect them from, from further damaging what might be an unstable spinal injury? All right. So what about C-spine injuries? Okay, so this is actually the most commonly injured part of the spine. It's the most vulnerable, right? It's the most bendy and it's the least protected. So it's the most prone to injury. Um, the prevalence of things like this in trauma, the most common age groups, these are interesting, right? So um, for a C-spine injury, there's two peaks as far as what's the most common. So the first peak occurs at ages 15 to 30, right? So these are our um, car accidents. These are our sports injuries in that age 15 to 30, right? So, um, and then the population greater than 65 years old, has the second peak in C-spine injury, and that's with most commonly falls, okay? The most common area of the cervical spine to get injured, um, or the most common areas, excuse me, are C2, and then C5, and C6, and C7. And then many of you have probably heard this, but C3, C4, C5, anybody wanna finish my sentence? Keeps the diaphragm alive. Keeps the diaphragm alive. Thanks, Steve. So C3, C4, C5 keeps the diaphragm alive. What does that mean? That means that trauma, acute trauma and severe cervical spine injury can compromise your respiratory status, okay? So depending on the level or the part of your spine that is injured, you're going to have various physiologic results depending on, again, where that injury occurs. So the injury that occurs, if it affects your spinal column or your spinal cord, excuse me, specifically, you're going to see different consequences of that in different parts of the body because every part of the spinal cord controls a very specific function. But it's remember, it's really important, the C3, C4, C5 keeps the diaphragm alive. So if you have step-offs or pain in that area, you're going to want to make sure you're doing frequent airway reassessments, right? Especially again, in these prolonged transport times, your patients will change over time. And we'll talk a little bit about secondary injury in just a few minutes. But as this injury matures throughout the course of your 30, 40, 50 minute transport, or your 30 minutes to rendezvous, those symptoms may change and they may worsen. Okay. So the patient might have a, enough of a compensatory ability early on to keep breathing strongly, 
But as the inflammation increases, they're going to have weakening of their respiratory effort if they have an injury in this area, C3, C4, C5, okay? Their diaphragm is getting less and less functional, which can lead to ultimately patients needing advanced airway management. So frequent reassessments are going to be your best friend in these cases. They're going to be your best friend, especially in prolonged transport times, which we'll talk about more in shock too. All right, here's our friend, um, the owl, again, reminding us that our neck can flex, extend, rotate, do lateral bending. It can be distraction injuries. That's when it pulls away or stretches and then compression injuries when you have axial loading. So when you land on the top of your head. So any of the ways that our neck can move can ultimately result in an injury. Um, and then in addition to these, these last two are other ways that we can hurt our necks, right? Um, in EMS, I think we're pretty used to saying no step-offs and no deformities while we're examining the spine. And that's an important physical exam finding, um, but it really only catches subluxation injuries, okay? Subluxation injuries are when one vertebrae has been completely disrupted in relationship to the other, right? It's when, uh, okay, here's one of our vertebral bodies. We're looking at it on the side and we know that this is what we want it to look like. And in a subluxation injury, it doesn't look like that. Here's one of them and here's the other one. Okay, so you can see that one, this is very bad because we want our spinal cord to run nicely down through the middle and that this is how our spinal cord goes. Whoops, this is going to cause a big injury here, right? But this is what you're feeling when you feel a step off, right? Um, a step off or a deformity, you're feeling those. Um, and again, the spinous processes technically is what you're feeling. So here's your step off that you're palpating. And that's when your vertebral bodies are off. Um, off record from each other. Okay. All right. I like the annotation thing. Hopefully that's helpful. All right. So primary versus secondary injury. This is a really important concept. And I think it's actually a really, it is a bad, it's a very bad day for someone. Um, I agree. So this um, primary versus secondary, I think is a really, really important concept in the rural setting. So we are going to spend just a, just a bit of time here. Um, many of these concepts we think about in head injury, but also they really do apply to spinal injury and spin or spinal cord injury. So your primary injury is the direct mechanical trauma that occurs at the time of the injury in itself. Okay. So that's, that's your injury, your primary injury. So that's the bones breaking. That's the neurons, uh, shearing, uh, or ripping or tearing. That's the spinal cord being, um, you know, Sublux like or, or pulled with with the verte vertebra like we just said. Primary injuries are often irreversible, um, specific, specifically in the pre-hospital setting, but and and surgically they certainly try to fix these. Um, and so often when they go in for a surgery, what they're trying to fix is that primary injury. That's the direct mechanical trauma. Okay. So what's secondary injury? If you're five minutes away from a level one trauma center, you don't really care, right? Uh, and you don't need to spend as much time learning and thinking about secondary injury. But for many of you, preventing secondary injury is something that is under our control and something that we need to be thinking about. So secondary injury is what happens after, after the primary injury. It's a really profound sentence that I wrote there. Um, and then it's initiated by this cascade of like complex pathophysiology reactions that occur um, because of inflammatory factors and blood flow and a lot of these other very, very intricate cellular level things that are happening. So examples of things that can kick off and worsen secondary injury um, and some of the in secondary injuries, um, the, the things we want to think about. So what can worsen a secondary injury? These, okay. Hypotension, all right. So that can make things worse. Hypoxemia, low oxygen levels, hyperventilation if your patient's breathing too fast. Inflammation, uh, not, a, not a ton we can do about that, but is something that will worsen secondary injury. Worsening edema, um, micro hemorrhages, meaning really small areas of bleeding, uh, micro thrombosis, really small areas of blood clots, and then electrolyte derangements, okay? So similarly to a TBI, you want to avoid a lot of these things. You want to avoid hypotension. So in trauma, sometimes we talk about this concept of permissive hypotension, meaning 
we're going to let patients ride at a little bit of a lower blood pressure. And this is setting of trauma until we can get them blood. Um, but if you suspect a brain or spinal cord injury, that doesn't apply anymore. So you're not allowed to be hypotensive if you have a brain or a spinal cord injury, okay? With longer transport times, you're gonna to wanna to be recycling that blood pressure. You're gonna to wanna to be watching and make sure that that blood pressure isn't trending down, 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 down. There's no magic number here, but generally in the protocols that we will get, um, the systolic blood pressure of 100 um, is kind of that cutoff that we use as the lowest we really want to tolerate in the setting of concern for, for head or spinal column injury. And depending on your capabilities um, and what level of training you are and what tools you have access to, sometimes the only way that you can treat that is with crystalloid, right? With, with normal saline or LR. Um, and that's okay. Sometimes that's where you need to start. But maybe considering initiating pressors, uh, maybe a dirty epi drip, and um, we'll talk a little more about that in a bit. But uh, depending on your capabilities and your training to avoid that worsening hypotension and maintaining perfusion to the core. This threshold also probably needs to be a different target for patients that are over the age of 65. They have a higher blood pressure at baseline. So we tend to target 110 systolic. Um, that's kind of been circulated as what we'll, we'll tolerate. Hypoxemia, we can treat, right? Make sure you put your... <laughs> yes, Steve, pressors and trauma. Hypoxemia, make sure you put your patients on oxygen um, because even transient hypoxemia, even one episode of a low oxygen saturation can worsen that um, can worsen that secondary injury, can really worsen some of these things that we see on the screen here. And then finally, hyperventilation. So you want to aim for an end title if you have end title CO2 reading on your rig of 35 to 45 in these patients, just like in your head injury patients, okay? If you have advanced airway management and you're controlling their breathing, that's your target and it's a little bit easier. Otherwise, you can, you can try to do some coaching, try to get your patients to slow their breathing down if they're awake and they're with it and they're able to participate because you really want to try to limit the effects that the secondary injury might have. So the H-bombs, as they're called too lovingly, hypotension, hypoxemia, and hyperventilation, those are things we want to avoid. So we want a O2 sat of greater than 90, we want a systolic of 90 to 100, and we want an end tidal of 35 to 45. And keeping things in that physiologic range can help with this secondary injury component and can help with this giant kind of inflammatory cascade that can occur and wreak havoc on these patients. Any questions on that? Okay, seeing none. So some of these specific types of injuries we might see in C-spine injuries. Um, so there is the Jefferson fracture. This is a fracture of C1. So the this is a vertebral compression fracture that's a result of axial loading. So think um, diving into a shallow pool, um, trampolines, trampoline parks, uh, gymnastics, folks that land on top of their head, okay? It's a burst fracture or a Jefferson fracture. And what we're looking at here, oops, what we're looking at, ah, nope, 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 okay. Uh, what we are looking at here, is why it's called a burst fracture. These are the fracture lines of this is the C1 vertebrae, okay? So it kind of, it basically explodes um, and is a very, very, very unstable fracture because you no longer have this nice ring sitting around your dens, um, your odontoid, sorry. You no longer have this nice ring sitting around your odontoid that attaches your head to your body, touches your skull to your spinal column, right? So um, very, very unstable fracture, not something you ever want to deal with, but certainly is something you need to be worried about if this is your mechanism. Okay. Nope. There we go. Um, hangman's fracture. So this is a fracture of the pedicle. Remember that part of the anatomy there? So the pedicle of C2. Um, so C2 is this vertebrae here, and it has this finger-like projection off of it. But the hangman's fracture is a fracture right here of the pedicle of this. It's caused by hyperextension of the spine due to abrupt deceleration. So 
um, in this very, oh, that's funny, it stayed on there. Um, in this very uh, unsettling photo that I found on the internet here, um, this is one of the potential mechanisms that could occur that could cause a hangman's fracture. Um, obviously, with what it's named after, you can imagine the other mechanism that can cause this kind of fracture. But it's that hyperextension of the spine from rapid deceleration. It's uncommon that you're going to have a significant amount of cord damage here, right? Um, because in in this one, this there there is some subluxation. This is pushed forward, but your cord is running like this. So depending on how this fracture looks, oftentimes your cord is okay. So that's the, another type of C-spine fracture that you can get your C2 or your hangman's fracture. And then there's the odontoid fracture, okay? So remember on C2, you have this finger-like projection that's called the odontoid, and these can get fractured from a flexion mechanism. There's three different types here. Um, you can see on the diagrams where those fractures are um, and kind of the severity of the um, of stability, depending on where that fracture is. So type one, just this top part here, usually is okay. Type two is at the base of the odontoid, usually not great, usually pretty unstable. And then type three, that fracture line really extends laterally into more of the mass of the vertebra vertebral um, column. And um, sorry, over here, and that is a very unstable fracture. So just different types of C-spine fractures and C-spine injuries that we can see and kind of how they happen. Any questions there? We're gonna move on to our next case here. Hey, Dr. Wright. Yes, sir. How about uh, some explanation of internal decapitation? Oh gosh, Steve. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, um, internal decapitation is a term that folks will use to describe um, basically kind of that disconnect between the skull and the spinal column. So um, remember here that this is a nice little kind of plug and socket situation where fractures here can result in um, or that burst fracture of, of C1 can result in that articulation or that connection to be completely disrupted. And so that nice, strong, linear connection of the skull to the spine is no longer there. Um, and so you have a complete kind of disconnection there, but sometimes it's the external tissues are still okay. The spine and the spinal cord have been torn internally. All right, good question, Steve. Next case, my back hurts. 48 year old man coming, uh, calling 911 with new onset back pain. He says that he's had pain for years with no clear onset, wasn't an injury. There wasn't anything in particular that he attributed it to. It just has been going on forever. In addition, every now and then the pain sometimes radiates into his right leg, sometimes his left leg, down his posterior thighs. It's worse when he's standing and it's associated with some numbness throughout his left lower extremity. So today was the day he decided to call 911. He's got a normal HEMT cardiovascular and abdominal exam. For a musculoskeletal exam, he's got tenderness to palpation L1 to L5, so lumbar one to lumbar five both midline and paraspinal. And then from a neuro exam standpoint, since he's presenting with back pain, we're gonna do a neuro exam. And he's strong, he's got good intact strength, five out of five strength and hip flexion, but it causes some pain, but he's strong. He can ambulate, but it hurts. And his sensation is diminished subjectively, meaning you're kind of like lightly touching on his legs and he's like, yeah, I don't know, it feels numb. So what do we mean when we say lower back pain? Um, lower back pain usually refers in healthcare to the lumbar and sacral spine, okay? So this, this lower region here, as we see in the diagram, and I'm pretty sure, I don't know for sure, but I, I can almost guarantee that everybody on this talk at some point has run a call where somebody's chief complaint has been back pain. 
or for that matter, how many of us personally have actually experienced back pain, right? A lot of us, a lot of us do, um, probably most of us. So tell me where your back hurts. Approximately 80 to 90% of emergency department patients who have back pain have non-specific back pain. Non-specific meaning it just hurts or it hurts in this whole area. It's not like, oh, it hurts only at L1, L2, or it hurts only at T10. It's this non-specific kind of vague nebulous target that we're trying to chase. If most adults, almost all adults at some time in their life will have an experience with a traumatic back pain, okay? And there's a huge impact on our society for this, right? This uh, contributes to a lot of financial loss. People lose work days because of back pain. Um, they have to go on disability and they are often utilizing the healthcare system for these issues, which cause is a cost to them um, because you have to, you know, pay these bills and pay for that ambulance run. So it's a big, big problem. Um, and, and it's our job to figure out what we can do about it in the emergency setting and what we need to be worried about. And that can be really hard to do. So we're going to talk a little bit about red flags. And we've kind of moved from the neck, but down into the lower back. But again, this can apply to anywhere along the, the spinal column. Okay. So historical red flags are extremes of age. So patients that are less than 18 really probably shouldn't have back pain. And patients that are greater than 50 are more likely to have something scary causing their back pain. Um, if their pain lasts for more than six weeks. So it's back pain that started and it's not like, oh, every now and then it hurts, but it's constant and it will not relent. If they have a history of cancer, if they have accompanying fevers and chills, if they have unremitting pain despite you know regular analgesi analgesics, and if they have a history of IV drug use or are immunocompromised. So those are your historical red flags, red flags about the patient's history when you're gathering their history. What about physical red flags? Well, again, if they have a fever, that's a problem, a red flag. Um, this got really tricky with, I think it was the Omicron wave of COVID where a lot of patients had really severe back pain and myalgias associated with it. So they were all coming in with like back pain and fevers and say, like, well, do you have meningitis or, or COVID? We don't, um, it's really hard to distinguish. So fever is a physical red flag, bowel or bladder incontinence. Okay. Losing, uh, losing control, peeing on themselves or pooping on themselves, saddle anesthesia. The way that I elicit if somebody has saddle anesthesia um, from a history taking standpoint, as I say, when you wipe after you go to the bathroom, can you feel the tissue paper or is it numb? Okay. Uh, most people know that have saddle anesthesia that something feels very different. Um, decreased or absent uh, anal sphincter tone. That's not something you should be checking in the field. Obviously, that's something we'll check in the hospital. Progressive neurologic defect and major or minor motor weakness. So all of those being red flags for this lower back pain. That's a lot of things. How can we remember them? If you guys are acronym people, here's a fun acronym. The acronym is the red flags. So a lot of the things that I just said, um, but in a nice acronym friendly order um, that encompass the red flags for back pain. Okay, so what's on our differential as far as patients that have back pain. And it's important to kind of think of the different things that can cause, again, this nonspecific back pain. Um, I really like it when PowerPoint comes up with different little diagrams for me. Um, specifically, I enjoyed this uh, something else and something scary. It came up with this little demon. Um, so, you know, thinking kind of through three different major categories for our differential diagnosis. Is it something within the spinal column? Okay. Is it, is it a problem with the spine? Is it a problem with the spinal cord? Is it referred pain from somewhere else? Or is there something else bad or scary happening that could be causing this symptom? Okay. So as far as things that occur in the spinal column that we worry about, is it a problem with the bone or a problem with the disc? You can have infections, you can have mechanical issues, you can have degenerative disc disease, okay? So those cartilaginous pads have worn away or there can be a malignancy in there. There can be metastases in the bone. Is it something still staying in this in the spinal column section here? Um, is it something with the cord or the nerves? So cauda equina syndrome, which we'll talk about, or transverse myelitis. 
or is it a muscle or skin problem, a muscle strain? Remember all of those, um, all of those uh, muscles that we talked about in those ligaments, those can get sprained and strained, just like you can sprain and strain your knee. Or what about zoster, right? If it's kind of midline or just lateral to midline, it's skin problems. Herniated disc. Yes, that's a disc that misbehaves and goes out of the little area that it's supposed to be. And then there's referred pain. So pain from somewhere else that's causing back pain. I admitted a patient that I thought just had chronic back pain that I couldn't get under control the other day, um, did a chest x-ray and she had pneumonia with a big pleural effusion. And that pleural effusion was situated very posteriorly. So the back part of her lung and it was presenting as back pain. So you can have vascular or pulmonary issues that are causing pain that you interpret as back pain. Big vascular issues, specifically the big vessel that runs down your chest and down into your, you know, over splits into your kidneys or your renal arteries or your also known as your aorta. So triple A can present as back pain. Dissection can present as back pain. GI problems, renal problems, um, PID, pelvic issues, all of those things can be referred pain that are presenting as back pain. And then what about, you know, other things and other scary things? We hear a lot, I think these, so herniated disc, disc herniations, nerve impingements, these are all words that we, I think, hear pretty often when we're thinking about back pain and when we're thinking about patients. Normally, so this is a diagram of our normal anatomy, um, you have these nice nerves coming off of the spinal cord here, and they should be surrounded by fat. They should have nice fluffy discs and they should have a nice bit of fat and, and um, other areas of cushioning around this. But what can happen with nerve impingement um, is that you, you start to lose part of that perineural fat signal. Um, and so you start to lose a lot of the surrounding fat and that compresses or pushes on the nerve. Nerves are sensitive. They're designed to be sensitive. That's why they do what they do but that can hurt, okay? So here's a cadaveric example of that. And you can see the things that are labeled here, but specifically what I want you to pay attention to. Um, and if we, we draw here, um, here's our spinal nerve that's exiting the, um, that's exiting here. And you can see all of this yellow stuff around it. Um, that's all nice spongy fat. Uh, and if that goes away, and you impinge your nerve, it can be very, very painful. Okay, getting better at this uh, annotation thing maybe. <clears throat> so a disc bulge, uh, herniated disc, disc herniations, disc bulges, they can happen in different ways. So those nice cushions that we talked about, they can bulge circumferentially, meaning they just kind of squish down very evenly. I think of when I am pushing down on a hamburger on the grill with a spatula. And if you push down nice in the middle and it spreads out from there in a nice circumferential way, that's how you want it to be. They can also bulge asymmetrically. So they can bulge more on one side than the other. Well, you can imagine if it's bulging more on one side than the other, then there's more of a nerve that's going to be angry on one side than the other, right? Patients can lateralize their symptoms. And then there's these biofeedback mechanisms associated with atraumatic back pain that are ways for our body to tell us that there's something that's wrong. There's something that's up, right? So you have your dermatomes. So those are the areas of your skin that are innervated by different parts of your spine. So the dermatomes are going to kind of help direct you to where the problem may be. And then again, you have symmetry versus asymmetry can lateralize things for you. And then you have trigger points or spe specific muscle groups that can be responding uh, to a painful disc. So, so some MRIs, remember I said MRIs are a lot better at identifying soft tissue things. So looking at some MRIs here um, on this picture here, so we have our um, cerebellum. So this is our brain up here. Remember our nice vertebral bodies going here. And then this nice light gray coming down here is also our spinal cord. Okay. So the way that this image is projected, what you can see is this disc. It should be like this, probably. This is more normal. But this 
little jerk is pushing way out from where it's supposed to, and it's disrupting the spinal cord right? So this is a herniated disc. Um, and this is a central canal disc protrusion, meaning it's coming out of the middle and it's pushing on the spinal cord. And this is if we were to take a cross section here and look at it. And you can see here, this one's a little more lateralizing, um, but the disc there that's pushing on this, which is the spinal cord, not a situation you want to be in. My cervical spine actually looks a lot like this. I have a nasty little disc and my husband is a trauma surgeon jokes and says I'm one bad sneeze away from paralysis, which is not actually how that works. But um, you can see how important those discs are and how when they start to go uh, somewhere they're not supposed to do, it's gonna cause problems, okay? Um, some more x-rays here with some pretty detailed projections of trying to figure out uh, from an x-ray, whether these joint spaces are aligned. And then x-ray here with lumbar compression. So again, we were looking at the neck then, but going back to this lower back pain, nerve impingement is very possible in the lumbar area and compression of, or building of the discs is also very possible. Um, in this image, if you guys can see, it's really subtle, but I'll show you again why x-rays are, uh, if I can get my mouse to cooperate here. Um, why x-rays are not great at uh, looking for problems. Right here is a L1 compression fracture. So you can see it's pretty subtle, but right there it has what's called height loss. Um, so that vertebral body is shorter than what they're supposed to, and that indicates a compression fracture. Okay. All right, so cauda equina, that's what we're always worried about, right? When we think of people with lower back pain, one of those big, bad, scary demon things that we think of is what's called cauda equina syndrome. Cauda equina is very uncommon, <laughs> okay? So 0.1 in 10,000, uh, and invariably does often result in permanent neurologic deficits, okay? So it, it is a surgical emergency. Um, but in the cauda equina, that anatomic area, what we're talking about is down here in the lumbar spine. So your spinal cord has ended, but the nerves have not. So the cauda equina is referring to, it's called, uh, I think it's Latin for tail of the horse, um, but it's the sack of nerve roots that leave the spinal cord. And then they come out between all of these spaces and the bones and then this of the spine and they connect to the lower part of our body, okay? So your spinal cord is ended here and then all of these nerve roots are gonna come out here. And you can see here, again, this is an MRI, an example of cauda equina, oops not letting me click on my annotations anymore. It's just to take a break. Anyway, you can see it. It's not subtle. Um, so we've got uh, the discs here and also this vertebral body uh, is a smushed mess of disaster. Uh, I suspect this is an infectious process and that's why this in, in um, as opposed to trauma, but you can see that this is completely pushing on uh, these nerve roots here and, and showing us cauda equina. There we go, we zoomed in on it, okay. Um, so a, a burst fractures can do this, fractures and dislocations can do this, and those are the most common vertebral column injuries that are associated with cauda equina. Um, the nerve roots are better than the spinal cord at regenerating, so it's better than, than a spinal cord injury, um, but certainly still needs, often needs an operation. And the sacral roots, so the lower down you get, um, are pretty delicate. So you have kind of a hefty section of the cauda equina, and then it gets more delicate. delicate. Um, and cauda equina syndrome in the setting of, of just herniated discs um, not associated other issues. If it's treated within 24 hours, sometimes you can prevent permanent damage. All right, we would be remiss if we were talking about back pain and we didn't mention pathologic fractures because that can be a very common, um, <laughs> excuse me, I'm so sorry. I tried to mute myself before that and I could not. Um, pathologic fractures and cancer. So um, a common area for many cancers to metastasize to is bone. And one of the most common bones for uh, cancers to metastasize to is the spine. Um, so benign and malignant tumors can cause myelopathies, can cause pain, uh, back pain and issues within the spine. 
And then again, you can get that external compression that can cause pain. And then oftentimes, you know, with the um, presenting symptom only being pain, it's easy to overlook things. And it's not that uncommon that we find an undiagnosed malignancy in a patient with a chief complaint of back pain um, because that's where the back or where the cancer has metastasized to. So the atraumatic back pain can be a symptom of spinal metastases. And again, the spine is the most common site for bony metastases to occur. They often have pain at the site of the lesion that's just this dull, constant aching, and it's usually not any better with rest. So in this image, um, you have uh, some x-rays again that show these lucencies or um, these kind of clear, so weird, it won't let me click on my little highlighter anymore. Uh, anyway, it shows, oops, these kind of clear holes. And this is showing what might be metastases. And this is a PET scan, um, a whole body nuclear med bone scan that demonstrates lots of metastases. And unfortunately, this patient has metastases in the um, colvarium or in the skull all along the spine here in the pelvis. These areas that light up is not what you want to see. But do you need an ambulance? This is always the, the question, right? And oftentimes in the field, we don't know. We've covered a lot of the scary things and the bad things that can happen. Um, but if they're neuro intact and they have no red flags, do we have to transport? Uh, is the ambulance the best place for them? Is that the best way for them to get to the hospital? Um, well, maybe, and, and we don't want our patients to suffer. And the pendulum of pain control has certainly swung very far in, in the direction of, of really moving away from aggressive pain medications as we're seeing all of these issues with on, worsening substance use disorders in our communities and overdoses. Um, there's, there's a happy medium in there somewhere, right? But the reality is Western medicine kind of sucks at treating back pain, right? We have Tylenol, ibuprofen, uh, lidocaine patches, maybe Tordol, or you get like morphine and fentanyl. Um, so what's the right move? What's the right medication? What's the right combination of treatments for these patients? What's the right place for transport? Do we take them all into the emergency department? Do we try to seek alternative options for them for transport? Especially in the rural setting, you know, you're the only ALS unit. Are you going to take yourself out of service for an hour on this transport of this back pain patient just so you can give them 200 mics of fentanyl and have them get discharged with an outpatient referral to physical therapy? Um, really, really hard decisions. Uh, and I don't have the answer. I do not have the right answer for you on that one. Um, but I am hoping that you will at least feel empowered by the information in this discussion to be able to be thinking about what some of the bad things might be and, and figure out, you know, what, who our highest risk patients are. All right. We might need a little break. We can stand up. We can stretch our legs. I am going to do those two things and I'm going to run and say uh, good night to my children. So give, uh, let's do five minutes and then we will come back. So we will come back at 7.15. BRB.
We'll get going here in just one more minute. And just a reminder to get your CEs, make sure you email Ryan Shelton at uchealth.org in order to get credit for being here for your evening. We've got a couple more cases to go through, and then we'll, of course, have time for questions. But if things pop up in the meantime, feel free to ask. I don't know if anybody drank coffee during that break. It looks good, but it's way too late in the day for me to have coffee. All right, here we go. Our case number three is a 26-year-old ballet dancer with the chief complaint of, I missed a, I don't remember how to say this in French. I think it's a salon. Uh, my, uh, my friend, my friend helped me build this case, uh, who was a ballet dancer. So here we are, um, limited, limited French over here. And I felt something give in my back and now my legs are getting weak. She noted that before the accident, her back had been bothering her on and off for the last seven or eight months. So, um, what's important here and what's not important here? Well, it's all important. Um, but that uh, sensation that she has of, of weakness really seems to get worse after walking for long distances. Um, and then she intermittently gets these kind of pins and needles sensations across her the, her foot. Um, she's no bowel or bladder symptomatology. Uh, she's no fevers or anything like that. You're going to do an exam for her and she is a febrile. She has a normal sensory exam, despite saying that she has this kind of pins and needles um, and she has intact strength despite this feeling of, of possible weakness. So myofascial back pain. Myofascial back pain syndromes can have presenting symptoms of a lot of different things, okay? So myofascial being the, the muscles and the fascia, right? So um, they can have this chronic aching muscle pain um, muscle spasms, stiffness, and sometimes even weakness. Um, and, and to determine the, the root sequelae and the root causes of these, it's important to rule out kind of mechanism, what happened to initiate this, and then some of the pathologic injuries, which we've talked about. So think on your exam for these patients of for trigger points. The most common trigger points are found in the scapula, uh, the levator, sorry, the levator scapulae, um, the quadratus lumborum, okay, and you can see those uh, here on the diagram, and the gluteus medius muscles, okay, so there's a difference between kind of that vague paraspinal pain, and then this concept of really having a trigger point or a trigger area that reproduces the pain that would indicate more of this myofascial back syndrome, okay, in the diagnosis of myofascial pain, again, muscle spasms in that triggering zone, oftentimes there are um, limited range of motion because of that muscle spasm and because of that muscle pain. And it's caused by these trigger points and dysfunction in this myofascial space. It's often the underlying etiology of chronic back pain. And its definition, as you can tell, as I kind of hedge and go in and out of gray zones here, the definition is somewhat nebulous, okay? Um, it can be really hard to define and it can be really hard to diagnose. That trigger point, what we refer to as the trigger point is that hyper irritable spot or it's an area of tightness or muscle fiber spasm that transmits that pain signal to a region of the back, to a dermatome, to a nerve. Um, it is sometimes um, grouped with other chronic pain conditions such as fibromyalgia and they're really, really hard to treat, okay? They're hard to treat in the emergency department. It's hard to treat this pain and it's hard to treat this pain, especially in the pre-hospital setting because this myofascial syndrome is often very, again, trigger point focused. Um, and the tools that we have in the pre-hospital setting are systemic, right? All of our pain control that we can give in the pre-hospital setting is, is a systemic medication. Um, so we need to keep our differential broad we need to look for red flags. We talked about those red flags. Having a temper tantrum, I think that's that stomping is a um, very angry five-year-old. Um, keeping our differential broad, looking for those red flags. Ask if the patient has a care plan. Um, and honestly, if you have 
um, depending on the setup of your system and your EMS system and the relationship you have with your local hospital, you can work in conjunction with your local emergency department and your local hospital um, to, to come up with a care plan for these patients. Once they've been diagnosed with some of these conditions, you can say, okay, our care plan that we have in conjunction with the hospital is that we're going to transport you, or um, our care plan is, you know, as we've worked with, let's help you with your home meds and see if we can get you to a position of comfort to follow up tomorrow. All of these are just examples of, of really trying to help to get your system to work with you. Um, you can't talk patients out of this pain, okay? You can't be like, oh, just take a big deep breath, help that muscle relax. That's often not going to work. You're gonna to wanna to ask the patient what works for them, work with your hospital to get a care plan. And, and it's important to provide validation, okay? Um, these patients are often in very real pain and they often have traumatic ex and frustrating experiences with the healthcare system um, as it takes years and years to diagnose some of these conditions. So some important considerations when we're thinking about treating, treating this kind of back pain. How do we treat it? Um, well, as I mentioned, we're pretty pretty not great at it in, in Western medicine, for lack of a more eloquent way of putting that. There was a scoping review, and this was done in Australia, but a lot of this is actually translatable to the United States as well. And they found um, and in the U.S. also that back pain is one of the top three reasons to call an ambulance. Well, there it is. That brings it home, right? One of the top three reasons to call an ambulance is back pain. And the management practice in back pain is widely variable. It's all across the map, right? We've got um, NSAIDs and Tylenol and opioids and benzos. Some people use benzos for, for muscle spasm and back pain. And really there is not great data and not great literature that says this is best practice of how you should treat back pain. And so that makes it really hard to have a consistent approach to atraumatic back pain, right? What we do know, so there's a lot of what we don't know. What we don't know is how best to treat it. What we do know is that nearly a third of patients who have back pain that are seen in an emergency department arrive there via an ambulance. So this is a big problem, right, for our EMS and for our healthcare system. A third of the patients who arrived to the ER with back pain came on an ambulance, okay? And the patients who have back pain that showed up on an ambulance have a higher likelihood of getting imaging they have a higher likelihood of getting opioid medication and they have a higher likelihood of getting admitted. Now, whether that's because they called 911 because they were more likely to have something bad is important to consider, but it's also important to consider that just by coming on the ambulance, even when they controlled for the outcome, um, put them at a much higher risk for having, it's uh, for getting imaging and for getting opioid medication. So we know this is a, a big, um, I hate to use the word burden. I don't like thinking of our patients as, as a burden on us, um, but we know that this is a, is a pretty significant account of, of what we do and what we have to deal with, um, but we don't know how to, how to deal with it and how best to treat it. All right. I believe this is gonna be our last case, which should get us right to where we need to be because this is a bit of a long one. All right, our patient, uh, we're gonna do case five. So our patient is a 75 year old female. Um, and this is actually a case that I had in residency that has uh, stuck with me forever. So um, she was a 75 year old female on a road trip with her husband and they were driving their RV down the highway when the car in front of them came to an abrupt stop. Uh, the patient had unbuckled her seatbelt and she was using the restroom in the RV with that sudden stop. So she was launched forward out of the restroom and she hit her head on one of the pieces of furniture. She kind of like slid down the aisle of the RV. Her husband stopped, called 911 and told his wife not to move. So you get on scene, her primary survey is intact and then you do your rapid trauma assessments. Her ABCs are intact primary survey, and then we're going to do a rapid trauma. So she has tenderness to the midline C-spine and a possible step-off that you palpate. We talked about those step-offs earlier in the evening. There's no external evidence of trauma. She has no abrasions. She has no cuts. She has no lacerations. She has nothing externally. Both of her upper extremities are weak, and she's not moving her legs at all. She has no movement in her bilateral lower extremities. All right, what's next? 
What more do you guys want to know? Staring into the void. Vitals. Thanks. Yes. Perfect. All right. So we're manually. Yep. And Steve, we're holding your instructor partner to hold C-spine. Remind the patient not to move. And then you're going to get a full set of vitals. And your full set of vitals is a heart rate of 60. A uh, blood pressure of 110 over 60, a respiratory rate of 25, and an end title of 33. What are we going to do next? Extricate oxygen. Good. Give her some oxygen. Maybe we'll, uh, <coughs> excuse me, get her extricated and begin transport. We're going to do the rest of our things in route, right? She has a lot of pain associated with the injury, um, specifically in her neck, but she doesn't have any pain in her arms and legs. And can, in fact, she can't uh, feel anything in her legs. So Becky's going to call a trauma alert. Yep. And we're going to start transporting. We're a ways away. And we have identified that this patient is likely very sick, right? So you're repeating your exam. Pain is still in the neck. She has the uh, past history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia hypothyroidism. Um, I only, I wasn't saying that weird to try to clue you guys into something. I literally just stumbled over the, <laughs> over the word. Um, she takes hydrochlorothiazide for her blood pressure and metoprolol. She takes it as statin and she takes Synthroid. She's been taking all of her meds. She has an allergy to penicillin. She's never had surgery and she doesn't drink and doesn't smoke. Okay. So we're in route and we're rural, right? So we're repeating our vital signs. We've recognized that this is a critically ill patient. We've called ahead to the hospital, but we're still 20 minutes out. So we're gonna repeat again, serial assessments and repeat vital signs because we've got a ways to go. So this is what your next set of vitals is. Heart rate is 46, blood pressure is 90 over 50, respiratory rate's 12 and end title is 46. It's almost, it's most certainly never a good thing when your heart rate and your end title match, okay? So uh, glucose was normal and I like it, start bilateral IVs. Yep, because what are we starting to see here? That our patient is likely probably most certainly going into shock. IV, yep, fluids, correct. And start making the bag. What bag are you making, Steve? Epoi, epi. You meant to say epi. All right. So Steve's making mixing an epi drip. Um, if, if you're a um, if you're a BLS crew or you're an e, yeah you're an EMR and you're an EMT and you're driving to your rendezvous point right um, you're recognizing that this is we're in the we're in the full stages of shock at this point. Okay. So IV access, ruling out other uh, um, obvious causes and driving, uh, calling and updating with a new set of vitals to who you're rendezvousing with, right? If you are a BLS crew and you're 20 minutes up the hill from um, your ALS rendezvous and you can get them on the radio, um, this is a really, really important update because like uh, Steve is saying there, you know, he's got some other tools in his toolbox that he can start preparing in preparation for what is going to soon be a very, very unstable patient. Okay. So the direction that she is going is not good. That's why we're doing serial exams. And that's why we're making sure to communicate with the next rendezvous point, whether that's the hospital, whether that's an ALS crew, whether that's a CCT rendezvous with a helicopter, with a fixed wing, this trend from okay looking vitals in a patient that's not moving their lower extremities and is weak in their uppers to then this is a, a very, very ominous uh, trajectory for this patient to be on. So we talked about this, right? Um, hopefully this is not a fairly reasonable scenario for you guys, but watch for these trends, right? Yes. Launch an air, uh, aircraft, uh, rotor. If you have the capability to do so, this is a patient you're going to want to fly, right? Because again, that trajectory, you want to look for trends when you have prolonged transports, when you're driving 30, 40, 50 minutes, you're cycling vitals, 
that means you get to watch where this this trajectory is is going. Are they getting better? Are they getting significantly worse? Or are they stable? Okay, you can be stable and still critically ill. If your next set of vitals was this again, you're technically stable. <laughs> your heart rate is stable from what it was before, uh, but it's still bad, right? So uh, we try to avoid the word stable, but you wanna look for that trend. You wanna look for that trajectory and then start to develop an approach on, on, on in, excuse me, an anticipating, yes, asystole is stable, um, and anticipating the next possible finding. So. When you have longer transport times, one of the things you're gonna to wanna to do is, okay, my blood pressure is gonna cycle in five minutes. What is my next step if my next reading is even lower? Or, okay, what's my next priority if my next reading is the same? If my next reading is the same and it's a normal blood pressure, maybe my next step means, what am I gonna do for pain control? If my next step is even lower, then you're going through this in your head, right? So if my next blood pressure is lower, I'm gonna make sure I have two IVs, um, and I am going to consider, um, you know, more fluid. I am going to consider launching the rotor. I am going to consider calling base medical direction for guidance. So start going through that next step in your mind so that you have your next move as soon as that pops up on your monitor, okay? So you are waiting for that next set of vitals. You're waiting for that change. But in your head, you've already anticipated what that looks like. So it's not a surprise. It's like, oh, well, yeah, okay, well, I thought she might start desatting. So I already have my non rebreather right here, and I'm going to get my suction ready. Um, and I'm going to ask my, my partner to um, get, the, get the BVM out in case the next time I look at her, um, her respiratory rate drops to six, right? So Really trying to look at the trajectory as a way to plan your different outcomes is going to be important so that you're not caught um, on a caught, caught on your heels. All right. So shock, right? Distributive shock. So there's different types of shock, and we're not going to cover, uh, we're only going to cover one, two types today. Um, but distributive shock is a category of shock that we use to talk about this widespread dilation of the blood vessels, right? So um, shock state being you're not getting adequate oxygen to delivered to your tissues, okay? Uh, so you're not getting enough oxygen to your tissues. So you're in shock state. In distributive shock, that's because your blood vessels have no tone, they're super dilated, and all of your blood is just pooling in places where it shouldn't pool, okay? Um, you have to have intact pipes in order to move the fluid where it needs to go. In distributive shock, your pipes are, are mush. The most common types of distributive shock, so again, this category being distributive, are septic shock, um, anaphylactic shock, so big allergic reaction is a form of distributive shock, and then neurogenic shock. Okay, based on the theme of our talk tonight, you can guess what we're going to talk about, right? So neurogenic shock um, is usually from a spinal cord injury, okay? It's classically characterized by hypotension, um, bradycardia, and peripheral vasodilation. Really bad combination, right? Hypotension and bradycardia. We don't like that. If we're hypotensive, we want our heart rate to go up, right? We want to compensate. Our, it's, our blood pressure is low, so our heart rate needs to go up. But in neurogenic shock, you have hypotension and bradycardia, and also from this, this um, loss of normal sympathetic nervous tone. So remember that your sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems, right? and your sympathetic nervous system, your fight or flight nervous system is the one that is responsible for keeping your blood vessels nice and firm. Okay. So it's, it's telling the muscles in your blood vessels to stay contracted. When that message is disrupted, like it is in neurogenic shock, then all of the muscles in your blood vessels react and that's when you get or relax. And that's when you get that vasodilation. Okay. That expansion of the blood vessels, they're all floppy. Um, and so the, the muscles and the blood vessels aren't getting the message to contract, and then it ultimately can, can cause this worsening hypotension. So neurogenic shock is due to loss of sympathetic vascular tone, and it really only happens after a big proportion of the sympathetic nervous system has been damaged. This can occur with injuries, uh, 
typically via textbook, they'll tell you T6, so thoracic vertebrae six and higher, okay? T6 and higher is where the majority of the big chunks of your sympathetic nervous system live. So any damage to your cord between C1 and T6 that's a severe injury can cause neurogenic shock. Um, and if patients have a complete lesion above the T6 level, meaning um, a, a complete transection or a complete injury of the entire spinal cord um, above T6, it, this will occur in 90% of those patients. So remember, C3, C4, C5 keeps the diaphragm alive. So depending, again, on where that lesion is, if you have a high C-spine lesion, you're going to need to be thinking about airway support. You're going to need to think about early intubation. You're going to lose diaphragm strength, just like you're using losing vascular tone. Again, if you're up here, you can lose diaphragm strength. You can lose your ability to manage your secretions. If you have problems with your other respiratory muscles, you can start aspirating significantly. You don't have enough respiratory effort. So in neurogenic shock, we'll do a quick critical care corner. Um, because I do know we have some critical care paramedics on our call tonight. So the mainstay of therapy for neurogenic shock is vasopressors and inotropes, okay? So that's gonna be your norepi or your epi with the goal of restoring a reasonable blood pressure and heart rate. Remember neurogenic shock being characterized by bradycardia and hypotension, okay? Um, so bradycardia can worsen the systemic perfusion. So it impairs the systemic perfusion even more. Even in patients that have a normal blood pressure in, in neurogenic shock, that bradycardia is going to be um, exacerbating the problem or can be enough to cause the severe shock. And that's why that inotropy is a really important component of their treatment. It's probably reasonable to target both an adequate heart rate and an adequate blood pressure. Okay, one is not enough. And the vasopressors with more chronotropy might be needed to achieve this, again, like epi or norepi and dobutamine. Um, and sometimes you need to think about anticholinergics um, because you kind of have this unbalanced parasympathetic problem happening. So you might need to be thinking about something like atropine or glycopyrrolate to counteract that excessive parasympathetic activity. Because remember, our sympathetic nervous system is kaput, which is why we're bradycardic and hypotensive. And then the parasympathetic nervous system is taking over. So you'll have increased secretions and other things that you may have to consider um, counteracting. This chart here really breaks down. Um, I'm sure Andra remembers having to memorize this like 6,000 times in residency. Uh, and now we have the luxury, of course, of getting to just refer to a chart, um, but breaks down the different effects that the majority of the vasopressors and inopressors have on the body. Um, or to the ED from C, exactly. Well, we're so fortunate to have our clinical pharmacists. Um, shout out to clinical pharmacy. But um, the different pressors are going to do different things, right? So our pure vasopressors are only really acting on those blood vessels. They're only going to act on the vascular tone. And then your inopressors are doing some with heart rate and some with the vascular tone, some with those blood, vessel, blood vessels, excuse me. So um, inopressors, that bottom chart, part of the chart here is where we're looking um, specifically at this norepinephrine and epinephrine. And no, no to dopamine, just no. Dopamine is a dirty, dirty medication, very, very hard to use. Um, but especially in the pre-hospital space, what we're really, really we're going to want to focus on and what our treatment for this sort of a patient scenario is going to be is going to be right in here. And why is that? Because it's increasing vascular tone. It's increasing heart rate. It's increasing, again, your SVR, your systemic vascular resistance increasing your cardiac output, increasing your blood pressure, doesn't do much in your lungs, which is great. Um, but where this is what we're going to want to look at when we're dealing with this neurogenic shock specifically. Any questions on neurogenic shock? Different than, oops, oops, I'm drawing dots everywhere. Okay, here we go. Different than spinal shock. 
Okay. Um, I think sometimes we understandably, because it's called spinal shock, um, it's common to get these two things confused. So neurogenic shock, again, is that distributive form of a distributive shock where um, you have that vasodilation, hypotension, and bradycardia. Spinal shock is something different. So spinal shock is actually not a true form of shock. In spinal shock, we're not actually talking about impaired oxygen delivery to the tissues, okay? Spinal shock refers to kind of this flaccid areflexia, meaning um, like floppy limbs or and, and no reflexes that can occur after a spinal cord injury. This can last hours to weeks, okay? It depends on the injury and depends on the patient. It can last, again, three to four hours. It can last three to four weeks. It can be kind of thought of as like a concussion to the spinal cord and it improves or resolves as that soft tissue swelling improves. Okay. Um, so it's characterized again by that flaccid paralysis, uh, no reflexes, and depending on the level of injury is to determine your severity of shock. It's, I think of it as kind of this temporary stunning of the spinal cord. Um, there are phases to think of in spinal shock, okay? Phase one is it from days zero to one. So that first day after injury, and that's when it's the worst. You have this like no reflexes, uh, you can't move your limbs usually, um, and you have uh, oftentimes this kind of um, concord, you can have a concordant neurogenic shock with this, right? But sometimes the neurogenic shock doesn't get better and the spinal shock starts to improve. So phase two is on day, usually, typically um, days one to three post-injury, you start to get the return of reflexes, um, specifically your cutaneous reflexes, okay? Um, phase three is day four to 30. So pretty significant range there. You may get totally better by day four, but it may be a month, okay? And that's actually, you get hyperreflexic. So you get kind of this paradoxical hyperreflexia that occurs on days four through 30. And then phase four, which is one month to one year, um, you can continue to have spasticity or hyperreflexia as this phase of spinal shock, but it's different. And the reason that we talk about it in the setting of spinal cord injury is obviously because it can occur with spinal cord injury, which we've been talking about a lot tonight, but also because spinal shock does not equal neurogenic shock, okay? Two very different entities with obviously two very different treatment uh, regimens. This has nothing to do with perfusion, vascular tone, has nothing to do with oxygen delivery to the tissues, has everything to do with uh, the kind of the motor and reflex components of a spinal cord injury. Okay, team, here we are. Summary points slide. This is good news for all of us. You get to stop listening to my voice very, very soon. But here's some of our take-homes for tonight. Um, your back pain can occur for a lot of reasons. We barely scraped the surface tonight um, on talking about all of the reasons that people can have back pain. Um, a traumatic back pain, traumatic back pain, um, C spine injuries, myofascial pain syndrome, cancers, cauda equina, disc problems, right? Some of these are scary, some of these are not. Um, but for our patients, they are often distressing. Um, we've come a long way with spinal motion restriction, but we still have a long ways to go. Um, there is a, a part of me that based on the direction that the literature is going, uh, really thinks that by the end of my career in medicine, C collars may no longer even be a thing. Um, spinal conditions, again, can range from muscle spasm to death, right? You can have a, a muscle spasm or you can have an injury that makes it so that your diaphragm doesn't work anymore. If you're rural, you need to reassess. If you're, uh, if you're gonna be in there for a while, you need to anticipate your next moves and create that large differential, okay? Differential diagnoses are one of the um, foundational pearls, or pillars, excuse me, foundational pillars in practicing, um, in practicing rural pre-hospital care, okay? Uh, we often, I, I hear paramedics say over and over again, well, we can't diagnose. Um, that doesn't mean you can't come up with a differential and treat based on the information that you have, right? So reassess your patients over and over and over again. Patients are dynamic. They change. You want to anticipate that next move, really be thinking about if my next assessment shows X, then I will do Y. 
um, and really know that so you're not caught off guard. And creating that large differential, again, is just something that will allow you to um, find the best and most appropriate treatment for your patients. So it's a unique environment that you all deal with and trying to use the resources you have to create the best outcomes you can for your patients um, requires a completely different way of thinking, um, again, than being 10 minutes away from a hospital. So, all right, questions from the group. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And while you're all thinking of your questions, uh, just a reminder, make sure you email Ryan. I will put the email in the chat. chchealth.org and I will stop recording.